The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representatives in your community. You have heard people say that money is the root of all evil. But it's a fact that money properly handled can be the source of much good. Properly managed, it can protect your wife and children against the future. It can assure your youngsters of a college education. It can help you own your own home free and clear. It can provide for a comfortable, independent old age. I say money properly handled. Most of us don't know how to handle it. But there is one man who can show you how. He's your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. In about 14 minutes, I want to tell you more about your local equitable representative and how he may help you, too, find security and peace of mind. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, auto theft. Its title, The Hot Sedan. During the past quarter century, the automobile has become a big business for the factory, the service station, the repairman, and the criminal. Figures compiled by your FBI from the reports of local law enforcement agencies show that last year alone, nearly 197,000 cars were stolen. More than the total motor vehicle registration of Minneapolis, New Orleans, or Cincinnati. Last year, auto theft was up 15% accounted for a high of $190 million worth of stolen property and was one of America's most profitable criminal activities. To combat this motorized crime wave, conferences are being held during the fall of 1952 at key points throughout the nation under the auspices of your FBI. Attending are representatives of state and local police, various motor vehicles departments, and the National Automobile Theft Bureau, a non-profit agency maintained by America's insurance companies as well as special agents of the FBI. Here, master strategy is being developed to make universal the kind of techniques and cooperation which, as shown in tonight's case, can run the car thief off the roads and into the penitentiary. Tonight's FBI file begins on a suburban highway near a large eastern city. The road is deserted, save for two cars streaking south toward the state line. The leading vehicle is a Cadillac sedan, current model, light green in color. Directly behind it, a 1948 Mercury convertible, black, with natural canvas top. Both cars are proceeding at a speed in considerable excess of the legal limit. Approximately three miles north of the boundary, their progress is observed by two troopers occupying a highway patrol car. Will you look at them? Hold your hat, Chuck. Here we go. The drivers of the offending vehicles react to the red light warning only by increasing their speed still further. Looks like they want to race, Mac. Yeah, they're doing 90 easy. The cat has out-of-state plates. Driver might be hot. He will be when we catch him. Approximately three-quarters of a mile from the state boundary, a gravel-surfaced road intersects the highway. The driver of the green sedan extinguishes his lights and turns sharply to the right. The Mercury, acting as decoy, continues down the road. Heads and tails, Chuck. I say the cat. So do I. The poorly surfaced, steep graded road runs along the edge of a precipice, creating extremely hazardous driving conditions. However, the green sedan, running without lights, maintains a high level of speed. Too high. Chuck, he's leaving the road. Over the cliff. When State Troopers Charles Humboldt and Oren McHenry reach the spot where their quarry has left the road, the green sedan is wedged between two boulders near the bottom of a 50-foot ravine. It has burst into flames. Hello, Chuck. 
Chuck. Oh, hi, Mac. Is that our Cadillac? <laughs> What's left of it? Boys just towed it in. Sure ready for the junk heap. Yeah. How about the driver? He's dead, Chuck. Oh, that's too bad. He looked like just a kid. Yeah, 18, 19. Huh. Any identification? No, not yet. I got a partial print off the rearview mirror. Yeah, oh, good deal. I'll drop it off the FBI office on my way uptown. Did you get a report on the plate yet? Yeah. They checked with a motor number, but... Yeah, but what? The registration shows a 52 Cadillac sedan, all right. Color beige. Could have been a repaint. Not unless they stripped it clean. Look here. You see? Besides, it's a new car. Yeah. Might be hot at that. Well, that kid sure wasn't running for his health. Well, I'll check it right away, Chuck. You better have the boys mark this wreck. Do not disturb till they've gone over it. Will do. Thirty-two hours later, at the local FBI field office, State Trooper Oren McHenry receives a full report on the green sedan and its driver from Special Agent Jim Taylor. Well, here's the way it shapes up, Mac. Car was stolen. Order number's been recut. Dyes don't match the company. Were you able to get the old number, Jim? Ah, no, no such luck. Mm. How'd they grab onto a registration? Well, maybe a pretty big operation. They're probably buying up wrecks and switching the papers. It's going to be pretty hard to identify them. Yeah, it sure is. Of course, if we can turn up the owner, he may have some special way of spotting his own car. Oh, right. Not very likely, though, considering the condition this one's in. You got any leads? Yeah. I, uh, man in Hillview over the state line reported the theft of a green Cadillac. His name is John Rensselaer. I'm going out to see him this afternoon. Mm, what about my fingerprints? Report in yet? Yeah, came back this morning. Good, oh, that's service. Yeah, somewhere. Um, here it is. Driver's name was Robert Emmett Watkins, called Bobby Watkins. Born Cincinnati, Ohio, March 18th, 1934. Mm -hmm. Served four months as juvenile in Cincinnati, petty larceny, a year and a half ago. That all? Um, disappeared after that. No family, no forwarding address, no trace. Cincinnati office is still working on her. 1934, just 18. Yeah, they start them young these days. Yeah. 18. Mac, we might pick up something from selective service. Do you think a kid mixed up in a thing like this would register? Uh, could be. His bosses wouldn't want investigators on his trail. You figure this for a ring, don't you, Jim? Big time operation? Yeah, huh? It's beginning to look that way. We've had over a dozen reports in the last three weeks, all involving registration switches in the same tri state area. Have you figured out their method of operation? No, not yet. That's what I'm hoping to find out at Hillview. <laughs> Wreck, huh? The total loss, huh? It's criminal, Mr. Taylor. That's what it is, criminal. That store should be prosecuted. Store? Yes, yes, Mason's. It's all their fault. That's where it happened. Uh, Told my wife she shouldn't go to that sale, wouldn't listen. The vehicle was stolen while your wife was shopping? Of course. Don't think she stood there and let them take it, do you? Had she left the key in the ignition? Naturally, naturally. That's how they work. The attendant parks the car, you pick it up, turn in the ticket when you drive out. Mm -hmm. well, had your wife lost her ticket? Certainly not. When she emerged from the store, burdened with packages, I might add, the car was gone, simply gone. Now, this was at the local branch of Mason's, or was Certainly. this... Certainly. Never go into the city. Too much traffic, too hot on the nerves. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Rensler. You've helped a lot. Now, about your car. Have you some way of identifying it? Of course. License number, No, no, I'm number. afraid they won't help. Isn't there some other way? What I mean is some purely personal way. Green sedan, standard model, nothing special well, about... Well, can you think of anything else... Wait a minute. There is one thing. Yes, sir? My wife has a peculiar habit. Folds her registration certificate into a little wad. Sticks it behind the ashtray. Might still be there. Yes, sir, it might. We'll check it. Teletype room, Taylor. Hi, Jim. They rang me through to you. Oh, hi, Mac. How'd you make out? It's Rensselaer's car, all right. Found the certificate wadded up behind the ash receiver. Thieves never touched it. It's pretty charred, but the FBI lab should be able to bring it out, all right. That's fine. That's the first break we've had. Yeah, now here's something else. Yeah? Chuck Humboldt just came back from the local office of the National Auto Theft Bureau. They've had 15 stolen cars reported as lifted from department store parking lots during the last couple of months. 
All in suburban branches, all on sale days. That's great. Now we've got evidence and an M.O. Yeah, all we need is a line on the gang. Now hold on. Maybe we got that, too. Huh? Our Washington field office is sending through a report on our selective service check right now. Mac, listen to this. Watkins was registered with his draft board, and he was due to report for medical next week. He's living at 318 River Street. That sounds hot, Jim. You gonna check it? Yeah, I'll meet you there. Better try the doorbell again, Jim. Yeah, I guess I did. Oh, hello. Hello, gentlemen. Good afternoon. You come about the room for rent? Well, this isn't about a room, ma'am. Oh, we're looking for a man named Watkins. Bobby Watkins? Yes. Oh, does he live here? Maybe, maybe no. Why do you want to see him? Well, I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. Here are my credentials. Oh, yes. Yes, but uh, uh, you want to find Bobby here. He's not at home. His wife may be at home. Uh, I didn't see him for three or four days. Uh, maybe you find him at the work. Oh, where's that? The garage. Uh, two, three blocks. Uh, let me see now. The riverfront garage. That's the one. Garage? That sounds like our setup, Jim. Sure does. Want me to drive over and take a look around? Yeah, will you, Mac? And be careful, huh? I'll talk to his wife. This Bobby Watkins' room? Who wants to know? I'm a special agent of the FBI, miss. Here are my credentials. Oh. Well, may I come in, please? Yeah. Yeah, come in. Thank you. Are you Mrs. Watkins? Yeah. I'm sorry. Why should you be? I ain't sorry. I ain't... Where's my husband, mister? What's happened to him? Well, Mrs. Watkins, I'm afraid he's dead. Oh, no. I knew. I knew it. Give me a handkerchief. Oh, sure. How did it happen? Car cracked up. Bobby didn't have a car. Well, it wasn't his car, Mrs. Watkins. He was mixed up in something. He was... He swore he wasn't. He swore up and down, but... I knew it all along. Would you like to tell me about it? It was after... After we found out that I was... About the baby. Mm-hmm. We needed money. We we needed it bad. He told me he'd got a job, an honest job, but... You don't make that kind of dough washing cars, mister. Do you? No, I'm afraid not, Mrs. <laughs> Jim, the gang. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, Mac. Come on in. Mac, this is Mrs. Watkins. How do you do, Mrs. Watkins? Hello. Jim, the gang was using the riverfront garage, all right. Legitimate repair set up in the front, closed off section and back for doctoring hot cars. Well, fine, let's get a warrant. No, I'm afraid not, Jim. They've already skipped. No, great. Wouldn't you know it? The wreck must have scared them off. No evidence? No, not even a fingerprint. Looks like the whole outfit slipped right through our fingers. You're wrong, mister. Ma'am? They didn't all get away. Bobby didn't. <laughs> We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Thirty years ago, a high school education was considered pretty good. Today, if you want to hold any important position that pays a better than average salary, a college education is almost a must. Now, most fathers and mothers know this. 
and they know that their children may be handicapped without it. The problem is how to assure such an education on an average income. That was the problem of Mr. George Anvers before he became a member of the Equitable Society. Am I right, Mr. Anvers? Correct. I have two little boys, and I guess like most fathers, I want them to have it better than I did. I figured a college education was the answer, but the question was, how could I do that on the kind of money I make? And how did you solve that problem, Mr. Anvers? My wife and I heard you describe an educational plan on this program. That's our famous Equitable Education Fund. That's right. So, as you suggested, we called our local Equitable Society representative. He showed me how we could put aside enough money over the next 12 years without financial hardship. The interesting thing about it is that if something happens to me, that fund becomes fully established with no more payments to pay. Incidentally, I, I'd like to congratulate the Equitable Society for employing men like our Equitable representative. He's a fine man and a good man to do business with. I think every member of our radio audience will find his own local Equitable representative a good man to do business with. Your Equitable Society representative wants to help you solve your life insurance problems. He will analyze your problems and draw up a plan within your income that will give you the most for your life insurance dollar. So if you have a problem, such as how to be independent in your 60s, or how to own your own home free and clear, or how to provide for the future of your loved ones, call up your good friend and neighbor, your local Equitable Society representative. Consult your local telephone directory for his name under the name of Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Hot Sedan. Reports compiled by your FBI show that the nearly 200,000 automobile thefts occurring annually in the United States break down into three general categories. First, as in tonight's case, there's the theft for resale, usually involving well-organized and well-equipped rings or gangs. Second, are cars stolen for use during the commission of another crime. The third category is the joyride theft usually associated with juvenile offenders. Criminals in the second and third categories seldom possess the equipment or the technique to make off with a properly secured vehicle. And even the professional car thief is less likely to choose a locked automobile parked within a garage or on a well-lighted thoroughfare. Therefore, your FBI joins with your local law enforcement officers in urging you to lock your car, lock your garage, and report suspicious prowlers to the police. You can help protect your own property. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office, 48 hours after the discovery of the abandoned riverfront garage. Special Agent Jim Taylor is briefing State Trooper Oren McHenry on the status of the case. Let's see on the garage was listed Howard W. Evans, Rockford address. It's a phony, though. What about the neighborhood, Jim? Oh, we checked it thoroughly, Mac. The outfit operated as a legitimate front. There's no local connections. Mm -hmm. You talked to that girl again? Emmy Watkins. Yeah. Yeah, she's still lost. She knows. Well, I guess we're up a dead-end street, huh? Well, maybe. We've got an agent checking with customs to see if we can turn up any of the other cars. Not much chance. Oh, excuse me, Mac. Yes, yeah, sir. Special Agent Taylor. It's Chuck Humboldt, Jim. Is Mac there? Yeah, right here. Hang on. For you, Mac. Chuck Humble. Oh, thanks, Jim. Yeah, Chuck. Mac, I got a hot one for you. Yeah? A back-to-school sale going on at Richmond, South Shore Branch. Parking lot attendant just reported a stolen Nash Rambler. Good deal. Jim and I will be right over. I've been running this lot for more than two years. First time anything like this has ever happened. I suppose you tell me how the loss was first noticed, huh? Well, I see this lady wandering around the lot looking at cars. I figured maybe she's lost. Now, what time was this? About 2.30, 3 o'clock. Uh -huh. When she tells me it's one of them little Nashes, I know. Right off, I know. Oh, how come? Well, I walked through the lot, see, coming back from lunch. There was only one of them little bugs. It was painted bright orange. That's why I noticed it particular. It's already gone. No, what made you so sure? You seen a guy drive it out. 
right past me. Mm. Did you get a ticket on it? Sure, took it myself. That's what I can't figure, Mr. Taylor. Nobody but nobody gets out of this lot without a ticket. Uh, now, wait a minute. Are you sure it was the right ticket? Did you check the number? There's a sale today, Mr. Taylor. We're pretty mobbed. You'd jam up the whole place. Well, then the ticket could have been issued on a different car. Possibly handed to a confederate who used it to steal the Nash. Yeah, yeah, it could. But then how would whoever got the ticket in the first place get their car back? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Now, are you sure didn't anybody get a car without a ticket? Anybody at all? Well, now that you mention it, there was one. <laughs> but she couldn't be mixed now, up with it. Who was she? A dame had lost a check on a black Mercury. Old-time customer. Was this a convertible with a light top? How did you know that? Well, that car has appeared in this case before. No kidding. Uh -huh. No, nah, no, Mr. Taylor. It just ain't possible. She just ain't the type. Oh, what type is she? Oh, you know, one of them see here young man numbers. About 50. Gray hair, no tip. Uh, well, did she find her ticket? No. No, I guess not. I checked the driver's license against the certificate on the Merc, though. It was her car, all right. Oh, do you remember her name? Gee, no. I... Well, did you get the windshield stub off of her car? Yeah, it's right here in my pocket. Why? Well, I'd like to check it against the ticket on the Nash. Well, that'd be over at the check stand with the rest of them. Okay. Uh, wait a minute, Mr. Taylor. Yeah? You mean you honestly think old lady hoity-toity parked here, handed the ticket to some guy so he could use it to steal a car, and then came out and talked me into giving her her own back? It's beginning to look that way. Well, what do you know? Comparison conclusively proved that the parking ticket issued on the black mercury convertible was the one used to effect the theft of the Nash automobile. Your FBI had now established a definite modus operandi for the car thieves. Legitimate tickets were being used to remove victim cars from the lots. Then later, the respectable appearing owner of the decoy car would reclaim her property by professing to have lost her stub. Acting on this knowledge, stakeouts are set up on the parking lots of all department stores conducting sales in the three-state suburban area. During a 10-day period, four such surveillances are established. Number of automobiles stolen? None. Number of suspects identified? None. Results? Nil. Then, shortly after noon, during sale number five, an Oldsmobile convertible is reported missing. Special Agent Taylor and the parking attendant, who have been planted on the store parking staff, Wait anxiously to see if the pattern will repeat itself. Hey, Mr. Taylor? Yeah. That dame coming now, the tall one with the gray hat, that's her, that's the one. Are you sure? Sure as I'm standing here. All right. Keep out of sight. I'll handle it. Okay, sir. May I help you, ma'am? Uh, why, yes, young man, perhaps you can. I seem to have mislaid my parking ticket. I don't suppose it's frightfully important, but it's very distressing. Yes, I I'm sure it is. I'm in quite a hurry, too. I'm Mrs. Perry, an old customer, a very old customer. I can pick out my car, show you identification. Oh, that, that won't be necessary, Mrs. Perry. We'll take your word for it. Why, thank you, young man. Thank you. I'm much obliged. Not at all. Glad to be of service. B24 to ST348. Suspect now leaving parking lot in black mercury convertible. License 17K for King, 3665. Over. ST348 to B24. Thanks, Jim. Is the car a hot one? No, Mac. It's the decoy vehicle. Hold on, Jim. I got her spotted. Here I go. Over and out. ST348 calling B24. ST348 to B24. B24. Go ahead, ST348. Suspect has turned on a parkway. I think she's headed for the bridge. Fine. I'll pick you up on the bridge approach. Stay with her, Mac. Okay, Jim, if I can. ST348 to B24. Calling B24. I lost you in traffic, Jim. What gives? Over. B24 to ST348. I think she's going to Earth. Yeah, there she goes. Into the Madison Garage. Madison Garage, isn't that place okay? It's supposed to be, Mac. 
Funny. I wonder why she's gone in there. So do I, Mac. I should say it's excellent. My 200, please. Okay, okay. Here, sign the receipt. Oh, very well. Martha, sure you weren't following? Look, you take me for an amateur. The boss wants a report, you know that. Very well. I left the store in the Mercury as usual. Drove to the Madison garage as usual. Had no trouble as usual. I met Michael, traded tickets, and drove out the Oldsmobile. Everything was just as usual. Look, the boss tells me to play it safe. And I just suggest that... Are you in that... charge here? Yeah, sorry, mister, you're too late. This joint's already closed up. That's right. It's closed up and for good. The members of the auto theft ring in tonight's case were convicted of interstate transportation of stolen motor vehicles and received sentences totaling 45 years in federal penitentiary. Special Agent Jim Taylor had quickly realized that the Madison garage might well serve as a second relay point in the complicated transportation system of the car thieves. He therefore set up immediate surveillance at the far exit to the subterranean garage and was able to spot the stolen car as it emerged. Confronted with the evidence against them, the thieves made a full confession, naming all of their confederates. As the case you have just heard demonstrates, your FBI and other law enforcement agencies are starting a concerted campaign to wipe out the automobile thief. They ask your cooperation. Almost without exception, our nation's leaders would tell you that life insurance is your best financial safeguard. Now, if you don't know much about life insurance, ask the man who does know. He's a neighbor of yours, your local equitable representative. Your problem may be how to own your own home free and clear years ahead of time, or how to enjoy a comfortable and independent life at 60, or how to provide for the security of your wife and youngsters. Your equitable society representative knows the answers. You'll find him friendly and helpful. Simply consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Armed Robbery. Its title, The Wayward Brother. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Robert Yale Libet. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Cabellia Leakey, Julie Bennett, Herb Butterfield, Whitfield Connor, Charles Maxwell, Dot Rankin, and Charles Stewart. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time where the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wayward Brother on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. There's fun for the whole family when Ozzy and Harriet come your way next. This program came to you from Hollywood.